ending as Donna McManus leads us in our call to worship.
saved us from our trials. Today we come because you have invited us to come. Our lips declare your praise, and we have come to exalt your name together. Lord, we confess that on many occasions we have failed to call on you. We have trusted our own strength and failed to give you your place. Forgive our stubbornness. Lord, we ask that you change and renew us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask you to say this. Amen. Friends, we give thanks to God that though we have forgotten God's commandments, though we have turned from God or thought that we could do the work of discipleship by our own strength, God still reaches out to us. God hears our calls and is faithful always. Friends, we are forgiven and freed by the work of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's sing our praise together with the glory of God tree. Timaeus, 
a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has been made well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord.
call out to a God who responds when God's people call is central to our faith. Today we celebrate that men and women listen to the voice of God, heard God's words, and challenged those in authority so that we would have a way of worshiping where we had scripture that we could study together in our own common language. That we would have hymns that were to familiar tunes, maybe not bar songs like Martin Luther would write his hymns to, but nonetheless hymns that were singable by the masses and not just the clergy. We celebrate that we have had leaders in our past who have had difficult conversations, who have stood up to those who would take authority from the church and try to oppress God's people. And today we also remember that our leaders are fallible humans. They heard God's word and were as faithful as they could be, and they still made mistakes, just like we do today. And we are grateful that we have a tradition in our church that every week we come and we confess that we make mistakes, that we need God's forgiveness, and that God responds to us. One of the traditions that arose from the Reformation was the Latin phrase, Ecclesia Reformata Centro Reformata, which means reformed and always reforming. Several scholars will add the phrase reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God. To him in that idea that the reformation is not just what we hope and imagine, it's tied to the word of God. Now this phrase, it might make you think that the church is constantly coming up with innovation, and you might think to yourself, if you've been a Presbyterian for a long time, well, Presbyterians are not particularly good at changing the way that they do things. But that is our heritage and our history that our church leaders and the laity were interested in ways that worship could be changed to make it so that the people of God could call out to God and hear God's response to them. They thought that the way the church was being done at the time hindered people from approaching God and having a full experience of God's liberating and just love for them. But the truth is that sometimes this phrase gets misused and made to sound like the church is being reformed by the people. When in truth, I think the reformers meant, and I hope we mean today, that the church is being reformed by God. And that we, as God's people, must be open to the work of God's Spirit. That the way that God is working in us will change the church. Today we are using liturgy written by the church in Scotland, written by a Zimbabwean pastor who is pastoring in the north of Scotland. The church in Scotland has changed dramatically in the centuries since John Knox was a leader. And we too have changed dramatically. The Presbyterian church today is probably very different from the Presbyterian church some of you might have grown up in. Because we hold to this idea that we are the church ever listening to the word of God, constantly being challenged to be reformed, to be made in God's image. Today our scripture readings from Psalm 34 and from Mark 10 are two stories of men who heard, who called out to God and heard God's response. And the introduction to the psalm, not all of the psalms have an introduction, but this one happens to have it. And so we can attribute the language of this psalm to King David, who was on the run from King Saul. King Saul, who was his father-in-law, who once favored David, changed his mind. 
saw David as a threat to his authority, and so went after David. David famously hides in the hill country, trying to get away from Saul, and has this run-in with Abimelech, who is the Philistine king, Philistines like Goliath and David. He's had a long history with the Philistines. He reaches Abimelech and he pretends that he is insane, so that Abimelech will be scared of him and send him on his way. And it works. And this is David's response. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to God and be radiant so that your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and saved from every trouble. David, in the midst of extreme circumstances, fearing for his life, being chased down by kings, calls out to God and recognizes that God has heard his cries and responded to him in his time of distress. I wonder, do you have a memory of a time that you have called out to God and God has heard your cries and responded to your distress? When Jesus is on the road to Jericho, he is surrounded, as he often is, by crowds. Jesus has been talking, as we have been studying the Gospel of Mark this fall, he's been talking about his role as the Messiah. And the disciples, for all that they try, they just don't quite see Jesus. They just don't quite understand who Jesus is. And then all of a sudden, out from the crowd, there is one voice that cries out. The voice of Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now the crowd, hearing him, maybe thinking that he is a little mad, try to silence him and say, don't bother Jesus. I don't know that Jesus actually took that as a challenge, but it seems that way sometimes in Scripture, that when the crowd tells someone to stay away or be quiet, that Jesus is more likely to call them forward. So Jesus stood still where he was on the road and said, come to me. The crowd changes their tune because of Jesus' response and says, take heart, get up, he is calling to you. And so throwing off his cloak, probably the one possession that Bartimaeus has as he's sitting outside the city gate begging for food and for money. The cloak kept him warm in winter, perhaps collected the food so that he could carry it. He throws that aside, almost as if he doesn't even care, and runs to Jesus. Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus says to him, go, your faith has made you well. Now, Bartimaeus could have gone, picked up his cloak, and returned to his family, returned to the city, done something with this new gift of sight for himself. But it's interesting in the story, he regains his sight and he follows Jesus on the way. Now, if you remember, when we talk about the Gospel of Mark, the followers of Jesus are called the followers of the way. So Mark is doing something kind of uh, pointed in this phrase. He's not just saying Bartimaeus followed Jesus as he's going into Jericho. He's saying Bartimaeus became a disciple of Jesus. Bartimaeus started to follow the way of Jesus. Just before this, you might remember the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I followed the law ever since I was a young man. What more do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus' response is, sell everything you have and follow me. And the young man leaves sad because he has so many possessions. Bartimaeus has the cloak. And notice how quick he is to discard that and follow Jesus on the way. Call and response. Bartimaeus and David, they call.
call out to God, trusting that God is going to respond. That God hears God's people when they call. I've been thinking this week about my own heritage. My dad is here and he is from the Kirk family. Kirk is a family name that's actually a Viking name brought over to Scotland and the north of England. It's a name that is uh, topographic, just like my, my name Lee is a field in Ireland. The name Kirk denoted a family that either worked at the church as a sexton, perhaps, or just lived near the church. I've always thought it was ironic that I would become a Presbyterian minister with the last name Kirk, but then I got married and <laughs> I didn't quite work out the same way. So it is deep in my heritage to be near the church, to be shaped by the church. We know now through the study of epigenetics that our things that we do in our lives, the environment that we're raised in, it changes even our, the fabric of our DNA and shapes not only us, but our future generations. So it is certainly true, and you can, I'll tell you stories about my grandmother and others in my family who have been shaped by the church, that that has been passed down to me. And so, we are a church that is always reforming. And so we, who have inherited this heritage, whether you're Scottish, whether you're Irish, whether you are from Zimbabwe, Zambia, whether you're from Southeast Asia, China, all around the world. You have brought a heritage to this room and this space. God has called you, perhaps called your family, and you have been shaped by that call and your family's response to it. And we are all charged with the work of listening to God's voice and responding as faithful people. One of my favorite authors is Adam Grant, and he writes a lot about how we think and learning how to think. And he wrote one day on what it used to be called Twitter, I think now it's called X, too many people spend their lives being dutiful descendants instead of good ancestors. Too many people spend their lives being dutiful descendants instead of good ancestors. Now, at first, I, I didn't like what he said. <laughs> um, because I, it matters to me that my family would think well of me. I think it matters to a lot of us. We want to make our families proud of us. We want to carry on the tradition, just as we've carried in these tartans of plans today. But there's something in it that's true. That's something in it that is that same idea that is the seed of being the church ever reformed and always reforming. And it is that we must be faithful to God's voice to us today because we know different things now than our ancestors did. We live in a different place than our ancestors did. We have different interactions, different kinds of communities, different kinds of church services. And thanks be to God that none of us are storming the front aisle to kill me or somebody else when we're doing communion, as was true in the Reformation. There are many good things about change, but it's a hard balance between being a dutiful descendant and a good ancestor. A hard balance between being faithful to what has gone before in the church and faithful to what God is leading us into. So my prayer for us is that we'll be like Bartimaeus. We will see Jesus. We will hear Jesus teaching and be able to throw off the things that might hold us back and follow Jesus in the way knowing that we have a lot that we might be throwing aside, but trusting that God is faithful to respond. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs>
And Donna will be leading us in a statement of faith from the Church of Scotland that was written in 1992.
you to join me in prayer of thanksgiving for our offering this morning. God, we give you thanks for the gift of life and for the gift of family and friends. We give you thanks for your provisions and for your guidance in our lives. We give you hope for the many moments in our lives when we have called on your name and you have answered us. Just as you heard David and Bartimaeus when they called upon your name, we know too well that you will continue to hear our prayers. Thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. Continue to lift up the Higginbotham family that is now home and in hospice um, care. We just need prayers for all that's taking place. And Val had asked that uh, on Facebook that um, his pain be relieved. Mm -hmm. So they all need strength and comfort. Yeah. For the Higginbotham family as they surround their loved one and as he is in hospice care. Lord, in your mercy. Sorry, my Donald plan is blocking me. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, before we go to God in prayer, we also want to celebrate faithful leadership in our church. This church is so blessed to have such a talented and uh, volunteering, that's, that's not a verb, but a church of volunteers that pull together so many amazing things. And today we give thanks especially 
to Pat and Max Skelton, who have since 2009 organized the Kirkin of the Tartan service, which now we call the Scottish Heritage, Scottish Heritage Service. Um, this is their last year of formally organizing. I'm sure they will still be faithful guides in the future, um, but we do have a gift of our appreciation for you, and we want to share our thanks with you all. So can I invite you to stand?
Friends, as we go out today, I invite you to join us for our potluck lunch in the fellowship hall. If you're visiting with us, we hope you'll stay and enjoy this lunch that's been prepared. We also um, invite you to come back next weekend on Saturday for the fall festival. If you have a chance to go out and shop the Halloween candy sales and want to bring some of those um, to the church this week, we, that would be much appreciated. As our benediction this morning, we will be watching a blessing that was created during the pandemic by the group The Celtic Blessing. So this um, song has been sung, it is going to be sung in Gaelic, and the translation is, The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Thank mm -hmm. you.